Thanks very much to Liam and to Shauna. Good morning. Is it a good morning? <laughs> it's a greeting, not a statement. Um, first thing I'd like to do is to say uh, thanks. I feel very honored to have been chosen to preside at the very first leadership symposium on behalf of the Institute. And um, the interesting thing, Liam's kind of given away a little bit of the game, but the closest that I've ever come to the branch, any branch of accountancy in my career so far has been turf <laughs> accountancy. Because my grandfather was a bookmaker. And anybody who comes from that sort of family realizes that there is no escape. There are two things that I've only ever remembered being fascinated by in my life growing up. One was horse racing. And the second was, I was always fascinated, as, even as a child, as to why some people succeeded and thrived in life and others did less so. And I was fortunate enough, or some might even say greedy enough, that throughout the last 20 years, I've managed to engineer it, that the passions that I had or the interests that I had actually developed or evolved into two different careers, which have run side by side and run in parallel. The first, as Liam has mentioned, for the last 20 years, I've written a regular feature on horse racing for the Sunday Independent up until last year. Um, and Liam was wondering about the overlap between performance and horse racing. And it's interesting, if you have a mind around performance, what it is you can learn when you sit alongside the likes of Willie Mullins and Tony McCoy and Dermot Weld and those type of people who are high achievers. There are very few things that we dominate in the world uh, as a nation for our size, but that's one thing that we really excel at. And there are one or two things that I've picked up along the way over the 20 years of doing that. In parallel to that, uh, I also founded a business about 20 years ago, which is called Flow Group. And the Flow Group, over the last 20 years, has worked with mostly large corporate international businesses and helped them manage performance through the ever-changing environment that we encounter and we find ourselves in. And if you look at some of the clients that we work with, most of these are very well-recognized names and very well-recognized brands. The interesting thing, or the interesting element, is that they come from all sorts of sectors. I think in the last 10 years alone, we've worked in 38 different industry sectors. We're now spread out across four different continents. And the only thing that unites any of these brands or any of these companies is that they're all looking to improve performance. And interestingly, over the last 19 or 20 years in doing this, I've noticed that there have been trends, and the top companies and the smart companies follow the trends, and they adopt the trends, and they get an edge. And what I'm going to talk to you about for the next 25 or 30 minutes is the latest edge that we've encountered in what we're working with, and the, the organizations and the clients right across the globe. And 40% of them are emphasizing or focusing on this latest trend. And it's a very simple one. It's a simple one, but it's a little bit unexpected or surprising because it's right under our noses. It comes out of our mouths, and it's conversations. Because if you think about it, the basic operating system around which business works is the individual exchanges and interactions that happen on a daily basis. That's how business gets done. And what I endeavor to do in the next 25 minutes or so, is just to share with you some of the things that are happening out there and hope that you find some value in it. Because there's one thing that we can say from the last four or five years that is, that is absolute, is that poorly conducted interactions and conversations in your business are on a daily basis, not just impairing performance, but they're having a definite impact on your bottom line. And given the audience that we have here, focusing on the bottom line and focusing on cost is something which is highly relevant. As I say, about 40% of our client base are prioritizing this whole area, and I'm going to share with you a couple of things. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to highlight what the problem is and how it manifests itself. Secondly, we're going to look at what the cost or the time involvement with that issue is. Thirdly, we're going to go to the root of that, which happens to be the neuroscience piece, and we're going to do a small education on neuroscience for the morning. The fourth thing we're going to do then is we're going to look at an actual conversation and bring the neuroscience to life. And the final thing, which is really the takeaway and the value add, is we're going to focus on some of the things that you can just take away and focus on as a result of this 
So hopefully the 30 minutes will be of some value and of some meaning to you. So if we're ready for that, let's buckle up. One of the interesting aspects or elements of working in a consulting role for the last 20 years is that you're outside of organizations. So you're able to look at organizations from the outside in. And when we look at business, we look at it as something which is very, very simple. It actually breaks down and it's a game of two halves. On one side, we've got what we call the mechanics of business. And business loves mechanics. So we talk about the structures, we talk about the systems, we talk about the processes, we talk about the policies, the procedures, the strategies, the projects, the action plans. And business is very, very comfortable with the mechanics. In fact, I'm guessing there are plenty of people in the room here, myself included very often, that if we never had to go near the humanics and we could just focus on getting the mechanics right and spend all of our time doing that, we'd be more satisfied. But as an old mentor of mine once said very early on in my career, he said, business is simple. It's the people. Problems come with hair on top. <laughs> Unfortunately, unless we get artificial intelligence to a point where we can outsource dealing with the people, it's something that's full and central for us. When a problem arises, business is far more comfortable focusing on the mechanics. Let's write a policy. Let's change the system. Let's get a procedure. Let's do a reorg. Why? Because it's tangible, it's measurable, and it's easy to do. We had a situation with a client a number of years ago where they were moving from a decentralized model to a centralized model. In the area of performance management, they went out and they looked and they realized that they had not one, not two, but 65 different performance management systems that were out there. And they spent 18 months trying to figure out how they could reconcile this and come to one central. It took them 18 months to come to a perfect one system for all performance management system. Six months later after introducing it, they realized it wasn't working. Why? Because they realized that they had diagnosed the wrong problem. The reason it wasn't working was because the managers didn't have the skill or the capability to have the conversations in the first place, so it really didn't matter what system you were using. The interesting thing about conversations and interactions is that they happen all the time every day. Here's a question for you. We're all sitting here as business leaders today, and our organizations are going to work throughout the day today. How many interactions do you think are going to happen in your business today? And do you think that they have an impact or a material impact on the overall performance of the business? We have one client who did the numbers. Premark, or pennies to you and I, they actually ran the sums on this, and they discovered that on a daily basis, across their 11 countries of operation, they have 220,000 individual interactions that happen. And they happen through multiple channels. There's the face-to-face -face interaction, there's the telephone interaction, there's the meetings interaction, which is increasingly virtual, and then you have the electronic interactions that are becoming more and more abundant across the world. We've discovered that through all of these interactions, you basically have one of three different outcomes. The first outcome, it's a bit like the gear shift in a car. We have the interaction, it does what it says on the tin, the business moves forward, and we move on. That's the D, or the drive. The second outcome that happens with some or many conversations is the N on the car. It's neutral. The conversation happens, and guess what? Nothing happens. The third category of conversation is even more sinister. Guess what? It's the OR. You can hear it crunching into reverse. And now instead of having one conversation, we now have unleashed a multitude of conversations. Now instead of having one meeting, we've got a multiplicity of meetings, some official, some unofficial. Now instead of having a few emails that have covered this off, we have a blizzard of emails with CCs and BCCs, and by the way, the head of the department is now involved. This resonating? And even though the, the reverse category is in the minority, the impact of the implication of it is absolutely huge. So, given the audience we have here, I wanted to share with you some of the research that we've done and some of the numbers. So if this is real and this is happening, which it is, how much, what, what does it shake down and what does it look like? As a result of this, it's having an impact on, our, on the performance of our organizations. And it typically breaks down in one of two categories. 
it leads to either a lack of clarity on one side or and a loss of commitment to implement what it is we said we would do. And these are some of the things that happen or some of the things that, that surface as a result of poorly handled conversations. You can probably recognize them. You can probably uh, uh, identify with them. If we think about this and we think about what we call it is we've titled it residue. Because if human interactions is really the oil that greases the machine and causes the machine of business to move forward, it's a bit like getting grit in the oil. If you get grit in the oil, it creates friction. And sometimes it leads to wear and tear. And ultimately, it can lead to breakdown. So this whole idea of residue that happens as a result of poorly conducted conversations is a real thing. And how real it is, is how much time leaders and managers actually spend having to manage this. When we think about it, we think about this as part of the daily grind of just going to work. We actually come to accept it as something that we can do nothing about. But let me just highlight, we have surveyed for the last five years and found that there's an international average of how many hours a week the average manager spends focusing on or dealing with residue. You might think about what it might be for you in your own organization, but here's the international average that we found. 12. I don't know if that seems high or it seems low relative to your own organization, but it's the stat that we've got. And if you turn that into metrics and you turn that into cost, we've actually measured this out with one client or with many clients, and here's an example of a live client in, in the financial services sector currently. If you take the 12 hours and you multiply it by 48 hours, number of weeks in the year, 48 weeks in the year, and you multiply it in this case by the client's average hourly rate, multiply that again by the number of people in the organization, you end up with a number. Now that's not a small number. And those of us who got out of bed a little earlier this morning will realize that this actually underestimates it because this isn't a three-point game. It's a six-point game. Because those of us who realize that our managers, when they're spending one hour managing or tidying up residue, the one thing they're not doing is spending the hour focusing on the business and driving revenue. So, <clears throat> is it possible to eliminate residue in an organization? Unrealistic. People are people. But it is possible to dramatically reduce it with a bit of attention. And that's what we're going to move towards. And in order to do that, I'm going to introduce you briefly to the area of neuroscience. This isn't going to be science class, but we're going to do it very, very briefly. And in order to do it, I'm, I need to introduce you to your brain. And to do that, I'm going to ask you to outstretch your arm like this with your fingers splayed, if you wouldn't mind doing that. Thumb in, fingers around, take your fist, move it close to your face, Turn around and say, hi, brain. <laughs> because this is a pretty good working model of your brain. It's about this size. It's about this weight. And it's got two core components which are, which are critical. So the fingers and the thumbs are reflected in two parts or components of the brain that we're going to focus on for today. The fingers are the thinking brain. The thumb is the feeling brain. And I'm going to describe what the function, the function of both. Individually, they're useful. But together, in combination, they're very, very dynamic. So let's talk about the functions of both and then how they work together and the risks involved. The first is the thinking brain. We're going to talk about the fingers first. The thinking brain is where we have our logic. It's what makes us logical as we navigate and migrate our way through the day. It's also where we have our problem solving. So the faculty of problem solving, from the moment you wake up in the morning all the way through the time you go to bed at night, whether it's 7 times 7, or doing the crossword puzzle, or what we're going to have for dinner this evening, or all of those big and small issues that we have to deal with on a daily basis, the thinking brain is your problem-solving brain, and it helps to solve those. But perhaps the most fascinating aspect of the thinking brain in humans is this whole idea of future. Now, this is a little bit like telling fish about water. But the thinking brain can imagine a future that doesn't yet exist and make decisions and choices in the present that enables us to navigate our way towards that future. We're the only mammals on the planet that do this to the extent that we do. 
We're not the strongest mammals on the planet. We're not the fastest mammals on the planet. We're not the most naturally weaponized mammals on the planet. But we are the smartest mammals on the planet. And it's because of this future brain or future orientation that we have. And it's why we dominate the planet. So where the green brain is at work, it enables us to imagine a future that doesn't yet exist and creatively work in the present and use the present to create that future or to arrive there. It allows us also to make decisions to sacrifice in the short term for the sake of the long term future. Isn't that really what the definition of leadership is? Thinking about the future and making decisions in the present that are going to lead us or enable us to build that future? Let's look at the feeling brain, or the thumb, the red brain as we call it. The red brain is a very, very different system, and it performs a very, very different function, which is equally critical. The red brain is like a 24-hour, always-on surveillance protection unit. It is there for one thing and one thing only, to ensure your safety. And what it does is, it's always on. What good is tomorrow, unlike future, if we can't survive today? So it prioritizes today. So let's imagine, you're a zebra, you're grazing in the savannah, a big lion jumps out. The one thing that the red brain doesn't want you thinking is, I wonder how we can build a better future. <laughs> Maybe if we befriended the lions, they could protect us. In that moment, it's only concerned with one thing, which is your survival. It's an older and faster part of the brain, and it reacts 100 times faster than the time it takes you to think a thought. So before you've even thought a thought, you're already gone, because it's only got one concern, which is survival. It's an expert on now. Let's look at how the two brains work hand in hand. Green brain, red brain. When we're operating at our absolute best, the green brain takes charge and owns it. And it prioritizes the big, big pic picture and outcomes for the future. The red brain is in the background and it's providing information on current concerns. If you think about it like a cockpit of an airplane, the green brain is the pilot, the red brain is the co-pilot. In the green first, red, red second system, you have a situation where the green brain is making the decisions, is focused on future, and is using the present as a means of navigating our way to the future. And it has the choice also of overriding the red brain so that we can subsume today for the, be for the, for the sake of tomorrow and the, and the improvement of tomorrow. That's green brain first, red brain second. What happens when the red brain takes over? The red brain is only focused on the now. It's only focused on the present moment. By being focused on the present moment, the first thing it does is it reorganizes the order or the sequence of your marbles. So now it's not green first, red second. It's red first, green second. It's prioritizing your survival in the moment, and it instantly activates your fight or flight response without you even knowing it. In the 21st century, the lions of the 21st century are no longer in the savannah. The lions of the 21st century are in the boardroom. They're in the team meetings. They're in the one-to-one -one conversations with our bosses. They're in our contract negotiations. And the threats that we experience are no longer physical. They are outside of the physical. They're things like threats to my reputation, threats to my status, threats to my, my position here, my territory, my budget. These are the threats that the red brain has experienced. And in, in experiencing the threats, <clears throat> it begins to dramatically change the way in which we think. So now it tells the green brain what to think about, and it tells the green brain what problems to solve. And the problems that it's trying to solve in the moment are, what do I need to do to get out of the situation? What do I need to do not to look stupid? What do I need to do to be safe? What do I need to do to close this down and get out of here? Red brain dictates to the green brain. And have we found ourselves in those situations where all of a sudden, when we confront our people, they've got all the excuses, they've got all the rationale, and they've got all the reasons. Their red brains are creatively coming up with all of those solutions. And in many cases, they're compromising the present 
the, the future in, in favor of staying safe and surviving in the present. How many of us can identify with the time where we know we've got a difficult conversation that we need to have, and we say to ourselves, I'm not going to get defensive. This time, I'm not going to get defensive. I'm not going to get defensive. Conversation's over. We walk away. I shouldn't have got defensive. I shouldn't have got defensive. I shouldn't have got defensive. It was that rationally, you know what you could have done or should have done. And what's happened in that moment is that once you get out of the situation and you move away, everything resets. So now, with clarity, after the fact, you say, I should have said that, I should have done this. I should have done this, I should have said that. You should all over yourself. And by then, it's too late. And we've created residue. Green brains solve green problems. Red brains solve red problems. Two green brains working on the same problem as two red brains will produce a dramatically different result. It's why many of the smarter organizations now are looking at things like performance conversations in the traditional way, and they're moving away from them entirely. And instead, what they're doing is they're tra training and educating their people to focus on how do we have conversations that actually drive performance. And I never cease to be struck by it because the world is divided. Liam, Liam talked a little bit earlier on about trust and the need to build trust. It's actually one of the biggest challenges within organizations across the globe. And if you take l most large corporate businesses, they're trying to bridge the divides that exist. And one of the clients that we're working with currently is a French PLC, and we're working with their UK headquarters and their UK business in London. And this day last week, so last Tuesday, I happened to spend it in the boardroom with the board members, 12 people. And what they're trying to manage as a, as a global business, international, is they're trying to manage a number of divides that they're trying to reconcile. One of the divides is the national divide. In this case, the Anglo-French divide. They're trying to manage the divide between the commercial and the support functions, between the regions and the headquarters, the gender divide, male to female. These are divides that we all know about and we're all trying to work on. But what I was struck mostly by during the time that I spent there, the day with the, with the board, was that the biggest divide of all is one that's invisible, but that's having a hell of an impact. And it's the red brain, green brain divide. So you imagine within a day, when the red brains emerged, the, initial, the, the instant impact that that has is it causes others around the room into a flight or flight response. And the impact of that is the focus becomes on self-preservation. And the number one casualty in that moment when that happens, even if it's only amongst a minority, is what is best for the business in the long term. There are seven things that we can do to keep green brains online. But because of the time that we have today, we don't have the time to do everything. So we're going to prioritize instead, focusing on the seven red cards. Red cards, in every way, in the sporting metaphor of, they produce a red card because they are the seven most common behaviors that we've discovered that trigger or causes red brains to act or get involved. In your, on your table, you should have one of these, little fold-out. And in the fold-out, you'll find the seven behaviors and the seven red cards and we're going to bring them to life. Each of these will be pretty self-explanatory. But these are the seven things that we've discovered that are most common. They're not the only things that will cause red brains to trigger, but they are the seven most common ones that we've discovered right across business and right across industry. The only one that might be a little bit hard to understand is the fourth one on the screen there, which is failure to clarify the there up front. And what the there is is somewhere which isn't here, which is a future outcome. So where we sit down and we have a conversation without clarifying what the future outcome it is, what the purpose of it is, and why we want to do it. So that's the only one that not, might not be clear. So in order just to bring this to life, science is science, but let's see it in action and let's translate it into something practical. We're going to look at a conversation that happens and regularly happens where two people disagree. 
So I'm going to set up the conversation by having the two people explain their point of view. So you're going to hear from both Barry and Lisa. They're going to describe their situation. Lisa wants to apply for a promotion. Barry is her manager. It's in a technical function within the business. <clears throat> she believes that she's ready for promotion. Barry believes that she isn't ready, quite ready yet. They're going to introduce themselves, and we're going to look at it through the lens of the red cards. So let's hear from Lisa first as she introduces herself. Hi, I'm Lisa. I'm uh, standing here outside of my boss's office. I'm just about to go in for a meeting that I scheduled with him. Um, I'm looking to have him endorse my application for promotion. I've been working with this company for seven years. I think that I'm ready for the next step of responsibility. I've proven my skills over the years. I'm, I'm the one people come to when they have questions, problems. I help them find solutions. So I think I'm ready to influence at another level. Um, so anyway, uh, like I said, a little nervous, but feeling confident. I've got this. Okay, so that's Lisa. Let's hear from Barry, who's the other party, and is her boss. Hi there. Uh, my name is Barry, and I'm about to go into a meeting with uh, an employee of mine, Lisa, who is a complete whiz in the IT department. Um, she's brilliant. She's, she's one of our best. Um, however, she's asked for my advice and my endorsement for her application for people management, and I'm just not sure that she's, she's not ready. Um, and I've got to deliver that news and, and I'm not sure how she's going to take it. Uh, the main thing is, is I do not want to lose her, especially to a competitor, but I'm really unsure of how she's going to take this information. Um, anyway, uh, wish me luck. So as just before we look at the, uh, the conversation, what I'm going to ask you to do is look at it through the red card lens. So this is going to be about a four minute long piece and I'm going to ask you to try to see the red cards as they appear, if they appear, and see the sequence in which they appear. I'm not going to say they're all in here, I'm not going to say some of them don't appear more than once, but it's just to look at a typical conversation that happens between two people and to identify where the red brain is. And just look at it from Barry's point of view, so we'll keep it simple. You're just looking at Barry and his red cards, if he plays them or if he doesn't. So, ready to go? Here we are. Hello, Lisa. Hello, Barry. How are you? I'm well. And you? Good. Uh, so you applied for a promotion. Where are you at with the application? Oh, well, I, I haven't actually filled it in yet. Um, I wanted to come to you first and get your advice. Uh, how ready do you think that you are for this step? Oh, I'm, I'm definitely ready. I mean, I, I think I've proven myself in my current role. Mm -hmm. and. I think I'll make a good manager, actually, if I'm given the opportunity. I am a key contributor. You say so yourself. Yes, you are. goes without saying. You're, you're a great asset to this organization. Um, but how do you think that you would cope with the greater responsibilities? Oh, well, I You know, it's I a would... big step when you move into uh, to people management. I remember when I was uh, promoted myself, I found it a big challenge. Um, there's a lot to take on. And, uh, you know, you're... You're, uh, you're managing people, you're coaching, you're, uh, you're giving feedback, you're doing appraisals. It's, it's a lot, you know, uh, and it takes a while to get it right. And uh, you have a lot of experience and a lot of management potential. Uh, are you sure you're ready? Well, I think so, yes. I mean, I've seen a lot of people with a lot less experience and expertise get promoted in the past and they seem to be doing just fine. I think I'll uh, make a good manager, actually. I, I'm looking forward to the challenge. I'm already the one people come to when there are issues, and I'm often the one who has to point out issues before they impact the business. And, you know, I think with a greater scope of influence, I could influence the system instead of just helping people work around the inadequacies. Well, do you not think that there are a few things that you need to, to work on first? Oh, well, I'm, yeah, I'm sure there are. Such as? Well, for example, your communication style. Uh, how do you think you come across? I'm not really sure what you mean, Barry. Oh. I am a key contributor. 
on this team. I'm the go-to person. I mean, I'm always willing to help and give advice, and I try to help them out the best way that I can. Our last team meeting, Kathleen wanted to make a suggestion about a potential change to the report. Do you remember how you spoke to her? No. Well, you were very condescending, and you made her feel and look like a bit of a fool. Are you, are you aware of that? Oh, come on, Barry. Her idea, it was impossible. And you know it. I mean, she clearly doesn't know how the system works or she wouldn't have suggested it. I said what needed to be said and she got the message, didn't she? I mean, what, what do you want me to say? Uh, be quiet, say nothing and, and let, the, the, let the business suffer? No, 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 not at all. Look, I, I, I just think that you're very direct with people and, and that is not a, a style that, that suits people management. Look, um, I just think that, that at this moment, your, your leadership style suits more to an autonomous role. Would you, would you not agree with that? No, I don't. I want this promotion, Barry. I think I deserve it. But you, you know, obviously don't. No, 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 don't get me wrong. Look, Lisa, I, I think you're, you're a fantastic worker. You're, you're, you're a top contributor. I just, I want to support you in achieving your goal. Frankly, Barry, it doesn't sound like it. I just don't think that you're ready for this. Not, not at this moment. Lisa, you asked me for my advice, I'm giving it to you. And I think that we can, you know, work on developing your people skills, but in the meantime, maybe something comes up that doesn't involve people management. You know, I'm fed up waiting, Barry. I want this promotion. And I think I'm more than capable of managing people, actually. Look, if you really want to move into people management, uh, we can do a development plan. I'll look into some courses uh, that may be available and, and we can start there. How does that sound? Yeah, it's fine. Thanks. Okay. Look, why don't we meet in, in what, say two weeks? Um, in the meantime, I can look into what courses are available and, and I'll email you the link. You can have a look at those. Um, we can have a chat about then. How's that sound? Yeah, that's great. Okay. Good. Thanks, Barry. <laughs> <clears throat> You have to admire her sense of irony at the end, <clears throat> where thanks doesn't mean thanks. Does this resonate? Do these conversations happen in the real world? Uh, question I have for you is, um, were you able to spot some of the red cards at play, Barry? Do you play some of them? Yeah. How many did you, how many did you count? Three? Any advance on three? Five? OK, as many as seven. And some, some, some of them repeated themselves. There were a couple of uh, repeat offenders. OK. Now, the interesting thing about it is, if you were rating that conversation on the outside in terms of its effectiveness as a conversation, how would you rate it? Give it a number. I'm hearing two, three, and four. So we'll say 3.147 as an average <clears throat> of 250 people in the room. <clears throat> now, interestingly, Barry's next meeting is the management meeting. And he goes and he sits alongside his two colleagues, Mark and Dave. And Dave asks him, I know you had a difficult conversation to have this morning. How did it go with Lisa? How's Barry rating it? Se seven or an eight? You know, it was difficult. It wasn't easy. I had some feedback. I gave her the information. We have a plan. I think I got away with it. <clears throat> now, Lisa, as she goes to her cubicle and starts to tidy out her effects, her next door neighbor, Cheryl, says, well, how did the meeting go for the promotion with Barry this morning? How's she rating it? <laughs> now, the interesting thing is, here you have reality. There are three sides to every story. Yours, mine, and the truth. But there's actually only one truth in this instance here. What is the true impact of this conversation? There's only one measure that actually has any currency. It's Lisa's. And there's only one thing worse than Lisa and the impact that it had on Lisa. Red cards trigger red brains. Red brains create residue. Residue has an impact. There's only one thing that's worse, is that Barry, in my organization, Barry is walking around thinking he's doing a good job. Because he didn't go out and intentionally do that. It was an impact that he did. He is a very well-intended, unskilled guy. And this is what we find. There are very many well-intended, unskilled leaders and managers. And the last thing that I'm going to finish up on or wind up on is this. And I'm going to link it back to something that Liam said. This whole idea about responsibility and leadership. In 20 years, the one thing that I really remark about leaders 
is that they vastly underestimate the impact that they have. Because we're just ourselves. We're just doing what we do, looking after ourselves and trying to keep green brains ahead of red brains on a daily basis. But the impact that we have far outstrips what we believe it to be. And here's a question I have for you. If that's true, and red brains are red, red brains, in your red brain moments, what of the seven red cards are the ones that you most default to whenever your red brain starts to bare its teeth? It's an interesting question. Some people are very self-aware, and you'll be able to open up your trifold, and you'll be able to say, these are the three things that I do. Other people, I have a fail-safe way of finding out what it is for you. All you do is, this evening when you go home, take your trifold, bring it to the kitchen table, gather around anybody who happens to be there, <laughs> and ask them to nominate the ones that you play on a regular basis, and they will leave you in no doubt as to which ones apply to you. And family being family, they'll probably give you a few more. <laughs> Thank you very much for your attention. I hope there was something valuable and useful in a very complex subject there. Thank you for that. And I believe that our real guest for the day has arrived. And I'm going to invite onto the stage Dave Weiner. <clears throat>